Section 7 of State of the Union Addresses, 1845-1848. through 1848. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording by Doug Fajardo. Section 7. James Polk, December 7th, 1847. Fellow citizens of the Senate and of the House of Representatives, the annual meeting of Congress is always an interesting event. The representatives of the states and of the people come fresh from their constituents to take counsel together for the common good. After an existence of nearly three-fourths of a century as a free and independent republic, the problem no longer remains to be solved whether man is capable of self-government. The success of our admirable system is a conclusive refutation of the theories of those in other countries who maintain that a favored few are born to rule and that the mass of mankind must be governed by force, subject to no arbitrary or hereditary authority. The people are the only sovereigns recognized by our Constitution. Numerous immigrants of every lineage and language, attracted by the civil and religious freedom we enjoy and by our happy condition, annually crowd to our shores and transfer their heart not less than their allegiance, to the country whose dominion belongs alone to the people. No country has been so much favored, or should acknowledge with deeper reverence, the manifestations of the divine protection. An all-wise Creator directed and guarded us in our infant struggle for freedom, and has constantly watched over our surprising progress until we have become one of the great nations of the earth. It is in a country thus favored, and under a government in which the executive and legislative branches hold their authority for limited periods alike from the people, and where all are responsible to their respective constituencies, that it is again my duty to communicate with Congress upon the State of the Union and the present condition of public affairs. During the past year, the most gratifying proofs are presented that our country has been blessed with a widespread and universal prosperity. There has been no period since the government was founded when all the industrial pursuits of our people have been more successful, or when labor in all branches of business has received a fairer or better reward. From our abundance, we have been enabled to perform the pleasing duty of furnishing food for the starving millions of less favored countries. In the enjoyment of the bounties of providence at home, such as have rarely fallen to the lot of any people, it is cause of congratulation that our intercourse with all the powers of earth, except Mexico, continues to be of an amicable character. It has ever been our cherished policy to cultivate peace and good will with all nations, and this policy has been steadily pursued by me. No change has taken place in our relations with Mexico since the adjournment of the last Congress. The war in which the United States were forced to engage with the government of that country, still continues. I deem it unnecessary, after the full exposition of them contained in my message of the 11th of May, 1846, and in my annual message at the commencement of the session of Congress in December last, to reiterate the serious causes of complaint which we had against Mexico, before she commenced hostilities. It is sufficient on the present occasion to say that the wanton violation of the rights of person and property of our citizens 
committed by Mexico, her repeated acts of bad faith through a long series of years, and her disregard of solemn treaties stipulating for indemnity to our injured citizens, not only constituted ample cause of war on our part, but were of such an aggravated character as would have justified us before the whole world in resorting to this extreme remedy. With an anxious desire to avoid a rupture between the two countries, we forbore for years to assert our clear rights by force, and continued to seek redress for the wrongs we had suffered by amicable negotiation, in the hope that Mexico might yield to pacific counsels and the demands of justice. In this hope we were disappointed. Our minister of peace, sent to Mexico, was insultingly rejected. The Mexican government refused even to hear the terms of adjustment which he was authorized to propose, and, finally, under wholly unjustifiable pretexts, involved the two countries in war. By invading the territory of the state of Texas, striking the first blow, and shedding the blood of our citizens on our own soil. Though the United States were the aggrieved nation, Mexico commenced the war, and we were compelled in self-defense to repel the invader and to vindicate the national honor and interests by prosecuting it with vigor until we could obtain a just and honorable peace. On learning that hostilities had been commenced by Mexico, I promptly communicated that fact, accompanied with a succinct statement of our other causes of complaint against Mexico, to Congress. And that body, by the act of the 13th of May, 1846, declared that, by the act of the Republic of Mexico, a state of war exists between that government and the United States. This act declaring the war to exist by the act of the Republic of Mexico, and making provision for its prosecution to a speedy and successful termination, was passed with great unanimity by Congress, there being but two negative votes in the Senate, and but fourteen in the House of Representatives. The existence of the war having thus been declared by Congress, it became my duty under the Constitution and the laws to conduct and prosecute it. This duty has been performed, and though at every stage of its progress I have manifested a willingness to terminate it by a just peace, Mexico has refused to accede to any terms which could be accepted by the United States consistently with the national honor and interest. The rapid and brilliant successes of our arms and the vast extent of the enemy's territory which had been overrun and conquered before the close of the last session of Congress, were fully known to that body. Since that time, the war has been prosecuted with increased energy, and, I am gratified to state, with a success which commands universal admiration. History presents no parallel of so many glorious victories achieved by any nation within so short a period. Our army, regulars, and volunteers have covered themselves with imperishable honors. Whenever and wherever our forces have encountered the enemy, though he was in superior numbers and often entrenched in fortified positions of his own selection and of great strength, he has been defeated. Too much praise cannot be bestowed upon our officers and men, regulars and volunteers, for their gallantry, discipline, indomitable courage, and perseverance, all seeking the post of danger and vying with each other in deeds of noble daring. While every patriot's heart must exult, and a just national pride animate every bosom in beholding the high proofs of courage consummate military skill, steady discipline, and humanity to the vanquished enemy exhibited by our gallant army, the nation is called to mourn over the loss of many brave officers and soldiers who have fallen in defense of their country's honor and interests. 
the brave dead met their melancholy fate in a foreign land nobly discharging their duty and with their country's flag waving triumphantly in the face of the foe their patriotic deeds are justly appreciated and will long be remembered by their grateful countrymen the parental care of the government they loved and served should be extended to their surviving families shortly after the adjournment of the last session of congress the gratifying intelligence was received of the signal victory of buena vista and of the fall of the city of vera cruz and with it the strong castle of san juan de ulia by which it was defended believing that after these and other successes so honorable to our arms and so disastrous to mexico the period was propitious to afford her another opportunity if she thought proper to embrace it to enter into negotiations for peace a commissioner was appointed to proceed to the headquarters of our army with full powers to enter upon negotiations and to conclude a just and honorable treaty of peace he was not directed to make any new overtures of peace but was the bearer of a dispatch from the secretary of state of the united states to the minister of foreign affairs of mexico in reply to one received from the latter of the twenty second of february eighteen forty seven in which the mexican government was informed of his appointment and of his presence at the headquarters of our army and that he was invested with full powers to conclude a definitive treaty of peace whenever the mexican government might signify a desire to do so while i was unwilling to subject the united states to another indignant refusal i was yet resolved that the evils of the war should not be protracted a day longer than might be rendered absolutely necessary by the mexican government care was taken to give no instructions to the commissioner which could in any way interfere with our military operations or relax our energies in the prosecution of the war he possessed no authority in any manner to control these operations he was authorized to exhibit his instructions to the general in command of the army and in the event of a treaty being concluded and ratified on the part of mexico he was directed to give him notice of that fact on the happening of such contingency and on receiving notice thereof the general in command was instructed by the secretary of war to suspend further active military operations until further orders these instructions were given with a view to intermittent hostilities until the treaty thus ratified by mexico could be transmitted to washington and receive the action of the government of the united states the commissioner was also directed on reaching the army to deliver to the general in command the dispatch which he bore from the secretary of state to the minister of foreign affairs of mexico and on receiving it the general was instructed by the secretary of war to cause it to be transmitted to the commander of the mexican forces with a quest that it might be communicated to his government the commissioner did not reach the headquarters of the army until after another brilliant victory had crowned our arms at cerro gordo the dispatch which he bore from the secretary of war to the general in command of the army was received by that officer then at jalapa on the seventh of may eighteen forty seven together with a dispatch from the secretary of state to the minister of foreign affairs of mexico having been transmitted to him from vera cruz the commissioner arrived at the headquarters of the army a few days afterwards his presence with the army and his diplomatic character were made known to the mexican government from puebla on the twelfth of june eighteen forty seven by the transmission of the dispatch from the secretary of state to the minister of foreign affairs of mexico many weeks elapsed after its receipt and no overtures were made 
nor was any desire expressed by the Mexican government to enter into negotiations for peace. Our army pursued its march upon the capital, and as it approached, it was met by formidable resistance. Our forces first encountered the enemy and achieved signal victories in the severely contested battles of Contreras and Churubusco. It was not until after these actions had resulted in decisive victories and the capital of the enemy was within our power that the Mexican government manifested any disposition to enter into negotiations for peace, and, even then, as events have proved, there is too much reason to believe they were insincere, and that in agreeing to go through the forms of negotiation, the object was to gain time to strengthen the defenses of their capital and to prepare for fresh resistance. The general in command of the army deemed it expedient to suspend hostilities temporarily by entering into an armistice with a view to the opening of negotiations. Commissioners were appointed on the part of Mexico to meet the commissioner on the part of the United States. The result of the conferences which took place between these functionaries of the two governments was a failure to conclude a treaty of peace. The commissioner of the United States took with him the project of a treaty already prepared, by terms of which the indemnity required by the United States was a cession of territory. It is well known that the only indemnity which is in the power of Mexico to make in satisfaction of the just and long-deferred claims of our citizens against her, and the only means by which she can reimburse the United States for the expenses of the war, is a cession to the United States of a portion of her territory. Mexico has no money to pay, and no other means of making the required indemnity. If we refuse this, we can obtain nothing else. To reject indemnity by refusing to accept a cession of territory would be to abandon all our just demands and to wage the war, bearing all its expenses, without a purpose or definite object. A state of war abrogates treaties previously existing between the belligerents, and a treaty of peace puts an end to all claims for indemnity for torturous acts committed under the authority of one government against the citizens or subjects of another, unless they are provided for in its stipulations. A treaty of peace which would terminate the existing war without providing for indemnity would enable Mexico, the acknowledged debtor, and herself the aggressor in the war, to relieve herself from her just liabilities. By such a treaty, our citizens, who hold just demands against her, would have no remedy either against Mexico or their own government. Our duty to these citizens must forever prevent such a peace, and no treaty which does not provide ample means of discharging these demands can receive my sanction. A treaty of peace should settle all existing differences between the two countries. If an adequate cession of territory should be made by such a treaty, the United States should release Mexico from all her liabilities and assume their payment to our own citizens. If, instead of this, the United States were to consent to a treaty by which Mexico should again engage to pay the heavy amount of the indebtedness which a just indemnity to our government and our citizens would impose on her, it is notorious that she does not possess the means to meet such an undertaking. From such a treaty no result could be anticipated but the same irritating disappointments which have heretofore attended the violations of similar treaty stipulations on the part of Mexico. Such a treaty would be but a temporary cessation of hostilities without the restoration of the friendship and good understanding 
which should characterize the future intercourse between the two countries that congress contemplated the acquisition of territorial indemnity when that body made provision for the prosecution of the war is obvious congress could not have meant when in may eighteen forty six they appropriated ten million dollars and authorized the president to employ the militia and naval and military forces of the united states and to accept the services of fifty thousand volunteers to enable him to prosecute the war and when at their last session and after our army had invaded mexico they made additional appropriations and authorized the raising of additional troops for the same purpose that no indemnity was to be obtained from mexico at the conclusion of the war and yet it was certain that if no mexican territory was acquired no indemnity could be obtained it is further manifest that congress contemplated territorial indemnity from the fact that at their last session an act was passed upon the executive recommendation appropriating three million dollars with that express object this appropriation was made quote, to enable the president to conclude a treaty of peace limits and boundaries with the republic of mexico to be used by him in the event that said treaty when signed by the authorized agents of the two governments and duly ratified by mexico shall call for the expenditure of the same or any part thereof End quote. The object of asking this appropriation was distinctly stated in the several messages on the subject which I communicated to Congress. Similar appropriations, made in 1803 and 1806, which were referred to, were intended to be applied in part consideration for the cession of Louisiana and the Floridas. In like manner, it was anticipated that in settling the terms of a treaty of limits and boundaries with mexico a cession of territory estimated to be of greater value than the amount of our demands against her might be obtained and that the prompt payment of this sum in part consideration for the territory ceded on the conclusion of a treaty and its ratification on her part might be an inducement with her to make such a cession of territory as would be satisfactory to the united states and although the failure to conclude such a treaty has rendered it unnecessary to use any part of the three million dollars appropriated by that act and the entire sum remains in the treasury it is still applicable to that object should the contingency occur making such application proper the doctrine of no territory is a doctrine of no indemnity and if sanctioned would be a public acknowledgment that our country was wrong and that the war declared by congress with extraordinary unanimity was unjust and should be abandoned an admission unfounded in fact and degrading to the national character the terms of the treaty proposed by the united states were not only just to mexico but considering the character and amount of our claims the unjustifiable and unprovoked commencement of hostilities by her the expenses of the war to which we have been subjected and the success which had attended our arms were deemed to be of a most liberal character the commissioner of the united states was authorized to agree to the establishment of the rio grande as the boundary from its entrance into the gulf to its intersection with the southern boundary of new mexico in north latitude about thirty two degree and to obtain a cession to the united states of the provinces of new mexico and the californias and the privilege of the right-of-way access across the isthmus of tehuantepec 
the boundary of the rio grande and the cession to the united states of new mexico and upper california constituted an ultimatum which our commissioner was under no circumstances to yield that it might be manifest not only to mexico but to all other nations that the united states were not disposed to take advantage of a feeble power by insisting upon wrestling from her all her other provinces including many of her principal towns and cities which we had conquered and held in our military occupation but were willing to conclude a treaty in a spirit of liberality our commissioner was authorized to stipulate for the restoration to mexico of all our other conquests as the territory to be acquired by the boundary proposed might be estimated to be of greater value than a fair equivalent for our just demands our commissioner was authorized to stipulate for the payment of such additional pecuniary consideration as was deemed reasonable the terms of a treaty proposed by the mexican commissioners were wholly inadmissible they negotiated as if mexico were the victorious and not the vanquished party they must have known that their ultimatum could never be accepted it required the united states to dismember texas by surrendering to mexico that part of the territory of that state lying between the nueces and the rio grande included within her limits by her laws when she was an independent republic and when she was annexed to the united states and admitted by congress as one of the states of our union it contained no provision for the payment by mexico of the just claims of our citizens it required indemnity to mexican citizens for injuries they may have sustained by our troops in the prosecution of the war it demanded the right for mexico to levy and collect the mexican tariff of duties on goods imported into her ports while in our military occupation during the war and the owners of which had paid to the officers of the united states the military contributions which had been levied upon them and it offered to cede to the united states for a pecuniary consideration that part of upper california lying north of latitude thirty seven such were the unreasonable terms proposed by the mexican commissioners the cession to the united states by mexico of the provinces of new mexico and the californias as proposed by the commissioner of the united states it was believed would be more in accordance with the convenience and interests of both nations than any other cession of territory which it was probable mexico could be induced to make it is manifest to all who have observed the actual condition of the mexican government for some years past and at present that if these provinces should be retained by her she could not long continue to hold and govern them mexico is too feeble a power to govern these provinces lying as they do at a distance of more than one thousand miles from her capital and if attempted to be retained by her they would constitute but for a short time even nominally a part of her domains this would be especially the case with upper california the sagacity of powerful european nations has long since directed their attention to the commercial importance of that province and there can be little doubt that the moment the united states shall relinquish their present occupation of it and their claim to it as indemnity an effort would be made by some foreign power to possess it either by conquest or by purchase if no foreign government should acquire it in either of these modes an independent revolutionary government would probably be established by the inhabitants and such foreigners as may remain in or remove to the country as soon as it shall be known that the united states have abandoned it such a government would be too feeble long 
to maintain its separate independent existence and would finally become annexed to or be a dependent colony of some more powerful state should any foreign government attempt to possess it as a colony or otherwise to incorporate it with itself the principle avowed by president monroe in eighteen twenty four and reaffirmed in my first annual message that no foreign power shall with our consent be permitted to plant or establish any new colony or dominion on any part of the north american continent must be maintained in maintaining this principle and in resisting its invasion by any foreign power we might be involved in other wars more expensive and more difficult than that in which we are now engaged the provinces of new mexico and the californias are contiguous to the territories of the united states and if brought under the government of our laws their resources mineral agricultural manufacturing and commercial would soon be developed upper california is bounded on the north by our oregon possessions and if held by the united states would soon be settled by a hardy enterprising and intelligent portion of our population the bay of san francisco and other harbors along the californian coast would afford shelter for our navy for our numerous whale ships and for other merchant vessels employed in the pacific ocean and would in a short period become the marts of an extensive and profitable commerce with china and other countries of the east these advantages in which the whole commercial world would participate would at once be secured to the united states by the cession of this territory while it is certain that as long as it remains a part of the mexican dominions they can be enjoyed by neither mexico herself nor by any other nation new mexico is a frontier province and has never been of any considerable value to mexico from its locality it is naturally connected with our western settlements the territorial limits of the state of texas too as defined by her laws before her admission into our union embrace all that portion of new mexico lying east of the rio grande while mexico still claims to hold this territory as a part of her dominions the adjustment of this question of boundary is important there is another consideration which induced the belief that the mexican government might even desire to place this province under the protection of the government of the united states numerous bands of fierce and warlike savages wander over it and upon its borders mexico has been and must continue to be too feeble to restrain them from committing deprivations robberies and murders not only upon the inhabitants of new mexico itself but upon those of the other northern states of mexico it would be a blessing to all these northern states to have their citizens protected against them by the power of the united states at this moment many mexicans principally females and children are in captivity among them if new mexico were held and governed by the united states we could effectively prevent these tribes from committing such outrages and compel them to release these captives and restore them to their families and friends in proposing to acquire new mexico and the californias it was known that but an inconsiderable portion of the mexican people would be transferred with them the country embraced within these provinces being chiefly an uninhabited region these were the leading considerations which induced me to authorize the terms of peace which were proposed to mexico they were rejected and negotiations being at an end hostilities were renewed an assault was made by our gallant army 
upon the strongly fortified places near the gates of the city of mexico and upon the city itself and after several days of severe conflict the mexican forces vastly superior in number to our own were driven from the city and it was occupied by our troops immediately after information was received of the unfavorable result of the negotiations believing that his continued presence with the army could be productive of no good i determined to recall our commissioner a dispatch to this effect was transmitted to him on the sixth of october last the mexican government will be informed of his recall and that in the existing state of things i shall not deem it proper to make any further overtures of peace but shall at all times be ready to receive and consider any proposals which may be made by mexico since the liberal proposition of the united states was authorized to be made in april last large expenditures have been incurred and the precious blood of many of our patriotic fellow-citizens has been shed in the prosecution of the war this consideration and the obstinate perseverance of mexico in protracting the war must influence the terms of peace which it may be deemed proper hereafter to accept our arms having been everywhere victorious having subjected to our military occupation a large portion of the enemy's country including his capital and negotiations for peace having failed the important questions arise in what manner the war ought to be prosecuted and what should be our future policy i cannot doubt that we should secure and render available the conquests which we have already made and that with this in view we should hold and occupy by our naval and military forces all the ports towns cities and provinces now in our occupation or which may hereafter fall into our possession that we should press forward our military operations and levy such military contributions on the enemy as may as far as practicable defray the future expenses of the war had the government of mexico acceded to the equitable and liberal terms proposed that mode of adjustment would have been preferred mexico having declined to do this and failed to offer any other terms which could be accepted by the united states the national honor no less the public interests requires that the war should be prosecuted with increased energy and power until a just and satisfactory peace can be obtained in the meantime as mexico refuses all indemnity we should adopt measures to indemnify ourselves by appropriating permanently a portion of her territory early after the commencement of the war new mexico and the californias were taken possession of by our forces our military and naval commanders were ordered to conquer and hold them subject to be disposed of by a treaty of peace these provinces are now in our undisputed occupation and have been for so many months all resistance on the part of mexico having ceased within their limits i am satisfied that they should never be surrendered to mexico should congress concur with me in this opinion and that they should be retained by the united states as indemnity i can perceive no good reason why the civil jurisdiction and laws of the united states should not at once be extended over them to wait for a treaty of peace such as we are willing to make by which our relations toward them would not be changed cannot be good policy whilst our own interest and that of the people inhabiting them require that a stable responsible and free government under our authority should as soon as possible be established over them should congress therefore determine to hold these provinces permanently 
and that they shall hereafter be considered as constituent parts of our country, the early establishment of territorial governments over them will be important for the more perfect protection of persons and property, and I recommend that such territorial governments be established. It will promote peace and tranquility among the inhabitants by allaying all apprehension that they may still entertain of being again subject to the jurisdiction of Mexico. I invite the early and favorable consideration of Congress to this important subject. Besides New Mexico and the Californias, there are other Mexican provinces which have been reduced to our possession by conquest. These other Mexican provinces are now governed by our military and naval commanders under the general authority which is conferred upon a conqueror by the laws of war. They should continue to be held as a means of coercing Mexico to accede to the just terms of peace. Civil as well as military officers are required to conduct such a government. Adequate compensation to be drawn from the contributions levied on the enemy should be fixed by law for such officers as may be thus employed. What further provision may become necessary, and what final disposition it may be proper to make of them, must depend on the future progress of the war and the course which Mexico may think proper hereafter to pursue. End of section 7section one of state of the union addresses eighteen forty five to eighteen forty eight this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org state of the union address james polk december second eighteen forty five part one fellow citizens of the senate and of the House of Representatives. It is to me a source of unaffected satisfaction to meet the representatives of the states and the people in Congress assembled, as it will be to receive the aid of their combined wisdom in the administration of public affairs. In performing for the first time the duty imposed on me by the Constitution of giving to you information of the State of the Union and recommending to your consideration such measures as in my judgment are necessary and expedient, I am happy that I can congratulate you on the continued prosperity of our country. Under the blessings of divine providence and the benign influence of our free institutions, it stands before the world a spectacle of national happiness with our unexampled advancement in all the elements of national greatness the affection of the people is confirmed for the union of the states and for the doctrines of popular liberty which lie at the foundation of our government it becomes us in humility to make our devout acknowledgments to the supreme ruler of the universe for the inestimable civil and religious blessings with which we are favored in calling the attention of congress to our relations with foreign powers i am gratified to be able to state that though with some of them there have existed since your last session serious causes of irritation and misunderstanding yet no actual hostilities have taken place adopting the maxim in the conduct of our foreign affairs to ask nothing that is not right and submit to nothing that is wrong it has been my anxious desire to preserve peace with all nations but at the same time to be prepared to resist aggression and maintain all our just rights in pursuance of the joint resolution of congress for annexing texas to the united states my predecessor on the third day of march eighteen forty five elected 
to submit the first and second sections of that resolution to the republic of texas as an overture on the part of the united states for her admission as a state into our union this election i approved and accordingly the charged affairs of the united states in texas under instructions of the tenth of march eighteen forty five presented these sections of the resolution for the acceptance of that republic the executive government the congress and the people of texas in convention have successively complied with all the terms and conditions of the joint resolution a constitution for the government of the state of texas formed by a convention of deputies is herewith laid before congress it is well known also that the people of texas at the polls have accepted the terms of annexation and ratified the constitution i communicate to congress the correspondence between the secretary of state and our charged affairs in texas and also the correspondence of the latter with the authorities of texas together with the official documents transmitted by him to his own government the terms of annexation which were offered by the united states having been accepted by texas the public faith of both parties is solemnly pledged to the compact of their union nothing remains to consummate the event but the passage of an act by congress to admit the state of texas into the union upon an equal footing with the original states strong reasons exist why this should be done at an early period of the session it will be observed that by the constitution of texas the existing government is only continued temporarily till congress can act and that the third monday of the present month is the day appointed for holding the first general election on that day a governor a lieutenant governor and both branches of the legislature will be chosen by the people the president of texas is required immediately after the receipt of official information that the new state has been admitted into our union by congress to convene the legislature and upon its meeting the existing government will be superseded and the state government organized questions deeply interesting to texas in common with the other states the extension of our revenue laws and judicial system over her people and territory as well as measures of a local character will claim the early attention of congress and therefore upon every principle of republican government she ought to be represented in that body without unnecessary delay i cannot too earnestly recommend prompt action on this important subject as soon as the act to admit texas as a state shall be passed the union of the two republics will be consummated by their own voluntary consent this accession to our territory has been a bloodless achievement no arm of force has been raised to produce the result the sword has had no part in the victory we have not sought to extend our territorial possessions by conquest or our republican institutions over a reluctant people it was the deliberate homage of each people to the great principle of our federative union if we consider the extent of territory involved in the annexation its prospective influence on america the means by which it has been accomplished springing purely from the choice of the people themselves to share the blessings of our union the history of the world may be challenged to furnish a parallel the jurisdiction of the united states which at the formation of the federal constitution was bound by the st mary's on the atlantic has passed the capes of florida and been peacefully extended to the del norte in contemplating the grandeur of this event 
it is not to be forgotten that the result was achieved in despite of the diplomatic interference of european monarchies even france the country which had been our ancient ally the country which has a common interest with us in maintaining the freedom of the seas the country which by the cession of louisiana first opened to us access to the gulf of mexico the country with which we have been every year drawing more and more closely the bonds of successful commerce most unexpectedly and to our unfeigned regret took part in an effort to prevent annexation and to impose on texas as a condition of the recognition of her independence by mexico that she would never join herself to the united states we may rejoice that the tranquil and pervading influence of the american principle of self-government was sufficient to defeat the purposes of british and french interference and that the almost unanimous voice of the people of texas has given to that interference a peaceful and effective rebuke from this example european governments may learn how vain diplomatic arts and intrigues must ever prove upon this continent against that system of self-government which seems natural to our soil and which will ever resist foreign interference toward texas i do not doubt that a liberal and generous spirit actuate congress in all that concerns her interests and prosperity and that she will never have cause to regret that she has united her lone star to our glorious constellation i regret to inform you that our relations with mexico since your last session have not been of the amicable character which it is our desire to cultivate with all foreign nations on the sixth day of march last the mexican envoy extraordinary and minister plenipotentiary to the united states made a formal protest in the name of his government against the joint resolution passed by congress for the annexation of texas to the united states which he chose to regard as a violation of the rights of mexico and in consequence of it he demanded his passports he was informed that the government of the united states did not consider this joint resolution as a violation of any of the rights of mexico or that it afforded any just cause of offense to his government that the republic of texas was an independent power owing no allegiance to mexico and constituting no part of her territory or rightful sovereignty and jurisdiction he was also assured that it was the sincere desire of this government to maintain with that of mexico relations of peace and good understanding that functionary however notwithstanding these representations and assurances abruptly terminated his mission and shortly afterwards left the country our envoy extraordinary and minister plenipotentiary to mexico was refused all official intercourse with that government and after remaining several months by the permission of his own government he returned to the united states thus by the acts of mexico all diplomatic intercourse between the two countries was suspended since that time mexico has until recently occupied an attitude of hostility toward the united states has been marshalling and organizing armies issuing proclamations and avowing the intentions to make war on the united states either by an open declaration or by invading texas both the congress and convention of the people of texas invited this government to send an army into that territory to protect and defend them against the menaced attack 
the moment the terms of annexation offered by the united states were accepted by texas the latter became so far a part of our own country as to make it our duty to afford such protection and defense i therefore deemed it proper as a precautionary measure to order a strong squadron to the coasts of mexico and to concentrate an efficient military force on the western frontier of texas our army was ordered to take position in the country between the nueces and the del norte and to repel any invasion of the texas territory which might be attempted by the mexican forces our squadron in the gulf was ordered to cooperate with the army but though our army and navy were placed in a position to defend our own and the rights of texas they were ordered to commit no act of hostility against mexico unless she declared war or was herself the aggressor by striking the first blow the result has been that mexico has made no aggressive movement and our military and naval commanders have executed their orders with such discretion that the peace of the two republics has not been disturbed texas had declared her independence and maintained it by her arms for more than nine years she has had an organized government in successful operation during that period her separate existence as an independent state has been recognized by the united states and the principal powers of europe treaties of commerce and navigation have been concluded with her by different nations and it had become manifest to the whole world that any further attempt on the part of mexico to conquer her or overthrow her government would be vain even mexico herself had become satisfied of this fact and whilst the question of annexation was pending before the people of texas during the past summer the government of mexico by a formal act agreed to recognize the independence of texas on condition that she would not annex herself to any other power the agreement to acknowledge the independence of texas whether with or without this condition is conclusive against mexico the independence of texas is a fact conceded by mexico herself and she had no right or authority to prescribe restrictions as to the form of government which texas might afterwards choose to assume but though mexico cannot complain of the united states on account of the annexation of texas it is to be regretted that serious causes of misunderstanding between the two countries continue to exist growing out of unredressed injuries inflicted by the mexican authorities and people on the persons and property of citizens of the united states through a long series of years mexico has admitted these injuries but has neglected and refused to repair them such was the character of the wrongs and such the insults repeatedly offered to american citizens and the american flag by mexico in palpable violation of the laws of nations and the treaty between the two countries of the fifth of april eighteen thirty one that they have been repeatedly brought to the notice of congress by my predecessors as early as the sixth of february eighteen thirty seven the president of the united states declared in a message to congress that the length of time since some of the injuries have been committed the repeated and unavailing applications for redress the wanton character of some of the outrages upon the property and persons of our citizens upon the officers and flag of the united states independent of recent insults to this government and people by the late extraordinary mexican minister would justify in the eyes of all nations immediate war he did not however recommend an immediate resort to this extreme measure which he declared should not be used by just and generous nations 
confiding in their strength for injuries committed if it can be honorably avoided but in a spirit of forbearance proposed that another demand be made on mexico for that redress which had been so long and unjustly withheld in these views committees of the two houses of congress in reports made to their respective bodies concurred since these proceedings more than eight years have elapsed during which in addition to the wrongs then complained of others of an aggravated character have been committed on the persons and property of our citizens a special agent was sent to mexico in the summer of eighteen thirty eight with full authority to make another and final demand for redress the demand was made the mexican government promised to repair the wrongs of which we complained and after much delay a treaty of indemnity with that view was concluded between the two powers on the eleventh of april eighteen thirty nine and was duly ratified by both governments by this treaty a joint commission was created to adjudicate and decide on the claims of american citizens on the government of mexico the commission was organized at washington on the twenty fifth day of august eighteen forty their time was limited to eighteen months at the expiration of which they had adjudicated and decided claims amounting to two million twenty six thousand one hundred and thirty nine dollars and sixty eight cents in favor of citizens of the united states against the mexican government leaving a large amount of claims undecided of the latter the american commissioners had decided in favor of our citizens claims amounting to nine hundred and twenty eight thousand six hundred and twenty seven dollars and eighty eight cents which were left unacted on by the umpire authorized by the treaty still further claims amounting to between three and four millions of dollars were submitted to the board too late to be considered and were left undisposed of the sum of two million twenty six thousand one hundred and thirty nine dollars and sixty eight cents decided by the board was a liquidated and ascertained debt due by mexico to the claimants and there was no justifiable reason for delaying its payment according to the terms of the treaty it was not however paid mexico applied for further indulgence and in that spirit of liberality and forbearance which has ever marked the policy of the united states toward that republic the request was granted and on the thirtieth of january eighteen forty three a new treaty was concluded by this treaty it was provided that the interest due on the awards in favor of claimants under the convention of the eleventh of april eighteen thirty nine should be paid out the thirtieth of april eighteen forty three and that the principal of the said awards and the interest accruing thereon shall be paid in five years in equal installments every three months said term of five years to commence on the thirtieth day of april eighteen forty three aforesaid the interest due on the thirtieth day of april eighteen forty three and the three first of the twenty installments have been paid seventeen of these installments remain unpaid seven of which are now due the claims which were left undecided by the joint commission amounting to more than three million dollars together with other claims for spoliations on the property of our citizens were subsequently presented to the mexican government for payment and were so far recognized that a treaty providing for their examination and settlement by a joint commission was concluded and signed at mexico on the twentieth day of november eighteen forty three this treaty was ratified by the united states with certain amendments to which no just exception could have been taken but it has not yet received the ratification of the mexican government 
in the meantime our citizens who suffered great losses and some of whom have been reduced from affluence to bankruptcy are without remedy unless their rights be enforced by their government such a continued and unprovoked series of wrongs could never have been tolerated by the united states had they been committed by one of the principal nations of europe mexico however a neighboring sister republic which following our example had achieved her independence and for whose success and prosperity all our sympathies were early enlisted the united states were the first to recognize her independence and to receive her into the family of nations and have ever been desirous of cultivating with her a good understanding we have therefore borne the repeated wrongs she has committed with great patience in the hope that a returning sense of justice would ultimately guide her counsels and that we might if possible honorably avoid any hostile collision with her without the previous authority of congress the executive possessed no power to adopt or enforce adequate remedies for the injuries we had suffered or to do more than to be prepared to repel the threatened aggression on the part of mexico after our army and navy had remained on the frontier and coasts of mexico for many weeks without any hostile movement on her part though her menaces were continued i deemed it important to put an end if possible to this state of things with this view i caused steps to be taken in the month of september last to ascertain distinctly and in an authentic form what the designs of the mexican government were whether it was their intention to declare war or invade texas or whether they were disposed to adjust and settle in an amicable manner the pending differences between the two countries on the ninth of november an official answer was received that the mexican government consented to renew the diplomatic relations which had been suspended in march last and for that purpose were willing to accredit a minister from the united states with a sincere desire to preserve peace and restore relations of good understanding between the two republics i waived all ceremonies to the manner of renewing diplomatic intercourse between them and assuming the initiative on the tenth of november a distinguished citizen of louisiana was appointed envoy extraordinary and minister plenipotentiary to mexico clothed with full powers to adjust and definitively settle all pending differences between the two countries including those of boundary between mexico and the state of texas the minister appointed has set out on his mission and is probably by this time near the mexican capital he has been instructed to bring the negotiation with which he is charged to a conclusion at the earliest practicable period which it is expected will be in time to enable me to communicate the result to congress during the present session until that result is known i forbear to recommend to congress such ulterior measures of redress for the wrongs and injuries we have so long borne as it would have been proper to make had no such negotiation been instituted congress appropriated at the last session the sum of two hundred and seventy five thousand dollars for the payment of the april and july installments of the mexican indemnities for the year eighteen forty four provided it shall be ascertained to the satisfaction of the american government that said installments have been paid by the mexican government to the agent appointed by the united states to receive the same in such manner as to discharge all claim on the mexican government and said agent to be delinquent in remitting the money to the united states the unsettled state of our relations with mexico has involved this subject in much mystery 
the first information in an authentic form from the agent of the united states appointed under the administration of my predecessor was received at the state department on the ninth of november last this is contained in a letter dated the seventeenth of october addressed by him to one of our citizens then in mexico with a view of having it communicated to that department from this it appears that the agent on the twentieth of september eighteen forty four gave a receipt to the treasury of mexico for the amount of the april and july installments of the indemnity in the same communication however he asserts that he had not received a single dollar in cash but that he holds such securities as warranted him at the time in giving the receipt and entertains no doubt but that he will eventually obtain the money as these installments appear never to have been actually paid by the government of mexico to the agent and as that the government has not therefore been released so as to discharge the claim i do not feel myself warranted in directing payment to be made to the claimants out of the treasury without further legislation their case is undoubtedly one of much hardship and it remains for congress to decide whether any and what relief ought to be granted to them our minister to mexico has been instructed to ascertain the facts of the case from the mexican government in an authentic and official form and report the results with as little delay as possible my attention was early directed to the negotiation which on the fourth of march last i found pending at washington between the united states and great britain on the subject of the oregon territory three several attempts have been previously made to settle the questions in dispute between the two countries by negotiation upon the principle of compromise but each had proved unsuccessful these negotiations took place at london in the years eighteen 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 twenty four and eighteen twenty six the first two under the administration of mr monroe and the last under that of mr adams the negotiation of eighteen eighteen having failed to accomplish its object resulted in the convention of the twentieth october of that year by the third article of that convention it was agreed that any country that may be claimed by either party on the northwest coast of america westward of the stony mountains shall together with its harbors bays and creeks and the navigation of all rivers within the same be free and open for the term of ten years from the date of the signature of the present convention to the vessels citizens and subjects of the two powers it being well understood that this agreement is not to be construed to the prejudice of any claim which either of the two high contracting parties may have to any part of the said country nor shall it be taken to affect the claims of any other power or state to any part of the said country the only object of the high contracting parties in that respect being to prevent disputes and differences among themselves the negotiation of eighteen twenty four was productive of no result and the convention of eighteen eighteen was left unchanged the negotiation of eighteen twenty six having also failed to effect an adjustment by compromise resulted in the convention of august sixth eighteen twenty seven by which it was agreed to continue in force for an indefinite period the provisions of the third article of the convention of the twentieth of october eighteen eighteen and it was further provided that it shall be competent however to either of the contracting parties in case either should think fit at any time after the twentieth of october eighteen twenty eight on giving due notice of twelve months to the other contracting party to annul and abrogate this convention and it shall in such case be accordingly entirely annulled and abrogated after the expiration of the said term of notice in these attempts to adjust the controversy the parallel of the forty-ninth degree of north latitude had been offered by the united states to great britain 
and in those of eighteen eighteen and eighteen twenty six with a further concession of the free navigation of the columbia river south of that latitude the parallel of the forty ninth degree from the rocky mountains to the intersection with the northeasternmost branch of the columbia and thence down the channel of that river to the sea had been offered by great britain with an addition of a small detached territory north of the columbia each of these propositions had been rejected by the parties respectively in october eighteen forty three the envoy extraordinary and minister plenipotentiary of the united states in london was authorized to make a similar offer to those made in eighteen eighteen and eighteen twenty six thus stood the question when the negotiation was shortly afterwards transferred to washington and on the twenty third of august eighteen forty four was formally opened under the direction of my immediate predecessor like all the previous negotiations it was based upon principles of compromise and the avowed purpose of the parties was to treat of the respective claims of the two countries to the oregon territory with the view to establish a permanent boundary between them westward of the rocky mountains to the pacific ocean accordingly on the twenty sixth of august eighteen forty four the british plenipotentiary offered to divide the oregon territory by the forty ninth parallel of north latitude from the rocky mountains to the point of its intersection with the northeasternmost branch of the columbia river and thence down that river to the sea leaving the free navigation of the river to be enjoyed in common by both parties the country south of this line to belong to the united states and that north of it to great britain at the same time he proposed in addition to yield to the united states a detached territory north of the columbia extending along the pacific and the straits of fuca from bullfinch's harbor inclusive to hood's canal and to make free to the united states any port or ports south of latitude forty nine which they might desire either on the mainland or on quadra and vancouver's island with the exception of the free ports this was the same offer which had been made by the british and rejected by the american government in the negotiation of eighteen twenty six this proposition was properly rejected by the american plenipotentiary on the day it was submitted this was the only proposition of compromise offered by the british plenipotentiary the proposition on the part of great britain having been rejected the british plenipotentiary requested that a proposal should be made by the united states for an equitable adjustment of the question when i came into office i found this to be the state of the negotiation though entertaining the settled conviction that the british pretensions of title could not be maintained to any portion of the oregon territory upon any principle of public law recognized by nations yet in deference to what had been done by my predecessors and especially in consideration that propositions of compromise had been thrice made by two preceding administrations to adjust the question on the parallel of forty nine and in two of them yielding to great britain the free navigation of the columbia and that the pending negotiation had been commenced on the basis of compromise i deemed it to be my duty not abruptly to break it off in consideration too that under the conventions of eighteen eighteen and eighteen twenty seven the citizens and subjects of the two powers held a joint occupancy of the country i was induced to make another effort to settle this long pending controversy in the spirit of moderation which had given birth to the renewed discussion a proposition was accordingly made which was rejected by the british plenipotentiary who without submitting any other proposition suffered the negotiation on his part to drop expressing his trust that the united states would offer what he saw fit to call 
some further proposal for the settlement of the oregon question more consistent with fairness and equity and with the reasonable expectations of the british government the proposition thus offered and rejected repeated the offer of the parallel of the forty ninth of north latitude which had been made by two preceding administrations but without proposing to surrender to great britain as they had done the free navigation of the columbia river the right of any foreign power to the free navigation of any of our rivers through the heart of our country was one which i was unwilling to concede it also embraced a provision to make free to great britain any port or ports on the cap of quadra and vancouver's island south of this parallel had this been a new question coming under discussion for the first time this proposition would not have been made the extraordinary and wholly inadmissible demands of the british government and the rejection of the proposition made in deference alone to what had been done by my predecessors and the implied obligation which their acts seemed to impose afford satisfactory evidence that no compromise which the united states ought to accept can be effected with this conviction the proposition of compromise which had been made and rejected was by my direction subsequently withdrawn and our title to the whole oregon territory asserted and as is believed maintained by irrefragable facts and arguments the civilized world will see in these proceedings a spirit of liberal concession on the part of the united states and this government will be relieved from all responsibility which may follow the failure to settle the controversy end of section one